to Mr. Sean Chang. Uh, yes, the company does pay for our hotel. A uh, hotel. Uh, they have a kind of partnership with a hotel, so uh, so we have this uh, duty. We actually have about eight and a half hour of rest time at the hotel. same trip as the one I'm showing now uh, from yesterday to until to today so I was back home like 5 30 a.m. in the morning so I'm still kind of like groggy and I'm doing a new night shift tomorrow so yeah um, I'm kind of uh, <laughs> displaced from myself it feels like um, after working night uh, basically feel like that I'm kind of detached from the world and that everything is like feels like cotton if you know what I <laughs> if you know what I get. Uh, yeah so it's just a weird feeling. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the soup chat John. like this and use the graphics uh, in your 
videos without being hit by a copyright strike. Uh, the reason for that is um, is the numbering on the character uh, on the cars. Uh, so uh, the higher up the number is, uh, the firm. Yeah. So uh, how am I going to explain this? Uh, carriage number one is always uh, furthest to the east, uh, going out from Oslo S. Thank you so much for the super chest, Roy Boy and Jay Johnson. Uh, is the volume on the microphone still low, or uh, or is it kind of the background noise from the video that is kind of overpowering the vocals? Or yeah. Winneman, yes, this is the same route as last summer, so each year during the summer when everyone is on vacation and the traffic volume in Oslo is kind of low, uh, then they do some really serious maintenance work and upgrades on most of the network around Oslo because that's where, of course, the highest traffic is. Uh, so during the summer there's a uh, bus replacement service for all the trains that goes from Oslo Central, Central Station towards Drama. But thankfully uh, we are gifted with this line, uh, which is uh, the line that the Bergen, the trains the Bergen actually started to run on when they first started to run. Uh, so. Uh, Back in the old days, uh, the trains used to run over this line before they switched it over when they connected uh, the west uh, line that went out from uh, Vestbom, which was a station near, uh, near the town hall in Oslo. Uh, and then they dug a tunnel uh, from Skøyen and connected it to what is today Oslo Central Station. And when all the trains was able to go to Drammen, they switched it and let the Bergen train also go through Drammen because it would catch more cities on the way to Bergen. So, is the background noise better now compared to the vocals? Well, uh, yeah, they do. They know about the channel.
Naomi, uh, that could happen uh, with the sleeper, uh, like next weekend or something. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. UK Sergeant. I really hope you like the mask. I wish, Van Luck, I wish. John Chang, uh, if you want to check out a channel, uh, I suggest you check out a channel by a colleague of mine uh, in Switzerland, of course. Uh, which is called Railway Emotions. Uh, he does practically the same thing as I do, and his content is great. BK24, uh, this part here is a course a lot better to drive because um, it's more in the outside instead of going through tunnel at, after tunnel after tunnel and I think that this part of the line is much more scenic than the line to Drammen uh, but the speeds are of course a lot lower uh, but yeah uh, I kind of like this it's a nice di diversion from our everyday Midham, uh, steam locomotives has never kind of been appealing to me, but yeah, uh, I, they're awesome. Uh, mind you, they, the engineering uh, of steam locomotives, it's top notch and it's truly awesome what they were able to do with steam, but yeah, uh, I'm kind of more into electric stuff, so yeah, sorry. Hey there, Bruce B. Welcome. Jay Johnson. Yeah, uh, we are doing this route and this diverted route every summer due to maintenance work in Oslo. Uh, so between Oslo and Drammen, they are doing some heavy upgrades and maintenance. So uh, every train that goes from Oslo through Skyen and all the stations to Drammen, they are replaced with bus. And for the trains that are westbound uh, uh, towards Bergen, they are actually able to divert over this line, which was the original part of the line for trains that was going to Bergen. 
Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a historic route we're running on and uh, it's a nice change. Thank you so much for the soup chat, CJ. Hey there, Stephanie. Doom 11, uh, steam powers your electricity. Well, uh, that might be the case in a lot of countries, but not here in Norway. Midheim, uh, I was on my way to become, uh, become an airline pilot at some point, uh, but um, there was this incident in on September 11th, some years ago. I don't know if you remember it, uh, but that kind of stopped everything because I was supposed to start at the flight academy uh, like two of two months or one month after the incident but due to the drastic change in the market situation they told me that mm -mm, uh, we recommend that you not become a pilot uh, because a lot of people are going to lose their jobs uh, which they did a lot of pilots did actually lose their jobs and um, <laughs> Funny thing, a couple of the people I was supposed to be in class with, they ended up as train drivers themselves after they lost their jobs later uh, in SAS. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's basically the reason why. John Chang, yeah, that would have been something like that. John Hart, yeah, uh, a friend of mine who used to be a train driver uh, and did all his training on <clears throat> by pulling money out of his own pocket. He uh, landed his dream job in an uh, airline company and he was basically laid off two weeks ago. Uh, due to the current situation, so yeah, it really sucked, so he's actually back driving trains. Uh, Phil, I like the evening shifts a lot more than working night, but uh, working night is no problem if you kind of get a night that is split, so you get some sleep in between, uh, then it's okay, but um, preferably uh, late evenings. John Skinner, back surgery? Oh, when is it due? Uh, no, I have not been in a possession of PPL. Thank you, Naomi. So am I.
Stephanie, yeah, I think that might have been kind of boring, like a seven hour journey from, uh, or six and a half hour journey from Oslo to New York. Uh, yeah, look, uh, to your left, you see clouds. To your right, there's no clouds. And down below, it's ocean. Catherine, uh, safer on the ground? Yeah, um, but um, I do this really weird thing uh, where I intentionally, at my own will, leave a fully functional aircraft with a backpack uh, with some uh, nylon in it. And yeah, I'm one of those crazy people. That's right, Big Al, John Skinner, uh, did they postpone it due to a rash? Was it bad? Midham, uh, the highest is flight level 200. Steve Cliff, uh, the round signs with a 7 in it. Uh, the 7 is the speed, uh, in this case 70 kilometers per hour. And since the signal is a round one with a black edge, that means that the speed in diverted track at that switch point is 70 kilometers per hour. Stephanie, uh, I skydive at a place called Voss where I live and it's a mountainous landscape and we land in a valley, basically. Hello, 44? Yeah, that's correct. 20,000 feet. I think we actually was on flight level 22. Um, or 22,000 feet. Uh, I think that was the highest we actually did. Uh, it was uh, it was funny. You can really feel um, the difference, uh, the density of the atmosphere. The closer to the ground you get, uh, so the air is really thin at that altitude. So you have to use oxygen on your way up, and then after that, leaving the plane, coming down, your fall rate will be a lot higher than if you jump from like fourteen thousand feet, but when you hit that like 5,000 feet mark for, from 5,000 feet and down to 3,500, the air becomes like really dense. So you could really feel uh, the pressure increasing drastically and the speed like slowing down a lot more. So it's really interesting. Thank you so, so much for the soup chat, Tony. Dennis Fox, uh, there is uh, some signals that have something called a day signal on it and you will see it like on the one we're passing right now. If you look just under it, you see kind of rectangle where, which is half and half yellow and black. That means that you're supposed to sound the horn between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Which again means that you don't need to sound the signal after 10 p.m. at night. Hey there, Patricia.
Stephanie asks, yes, I can use the GoPro on my uh, skydives and I have filmed a lot. Well, uh, basically it started with that I wanted to show you guys what it really looked like. And I thought of it, I think it was in 2009, but back then the camera technology wasn't like really good. And um, so I kind of didn't do it until I, you know, until the GoPro started to become quite good and of course my knowledge of uh, how to do it and so yeah this is the result thank you so much for the soup chat Herney Paul Bradford, uh, those rect upright rectangular uh, with you have one uh, diagonal uh, yellow stripe and then you have two and then you have three. So those are distance markers to, uh, the, uh, to the main signal. So one stripe is 1000 meter, uh, two stripes are 800 meters and when you see three stripes that means that the main signal is 250 meters ahead. And the ones with three stripes are usually used when you're not able to have a free line of sight to the main signal. This is quite useful if the signal is set to red, which means stop, so then you know how far it is to the signal. So yeah, kind of great. You're welcome, David.
Chris Truman. Yes, this is as dark as it gets in Norway during the summer. Uh, and this is the Oslo area, so we can imagine how light it is when you get to the further north, or far north of Norway. Uh, during the summer there, uh, the sun actually doesn't dip be uh, beyond the horizon. So yeah, it's uh, daylight all night and all day. BK24, we, we kind of encounter animals all the time, but thankfully they have started to clean out the trench meters to each side of the track, and that has reduced animal hits and strikes a lot. Uh, so it's been quite a while since I hit a deer or moose. Uh, but sadly, there are a lot of small birds that, I know, gets hit by the train all the time. Hardling, uh, in some sense, it does. Uh, I was kind of... I was surprised of how much light this camera was able to catch but what you are seeing here in the video right now it's exactly what I saw so that's what I do with these videos is to show you how it actually looks uh, when I drive Uh, I saw a question earlier um, that asked when they switched from uh, switch from going over to uh, That was when the Oslo tunnel, the tunnel from uh, Oslo Central Station to Skøyen, that was when that one opened, and that opened in June 1980. Vendor, thank you so so much for the super chat. Thank you so much for the super sticker shark girl. Yasha DJ, yes, we have a union, and all drivers in Norway are in that same union, so yeah, we're pretty covered. Thank you so much for the super chat, Sorschling. Thank you for becoming a member, Sean.
BK24, uh, what other lines around the world I like? Um, that one is kind of hard. Um, well, there's a lot of lines in the United States I actually kind of like because of time spent in different simulators. Uh, so the Northeast Corridor is kind of fun. Mariah's Pass is really fun. Uh, and I would have to say that the high-speed lines in Europe are quite interesting as well. Uh, but scenic-wise, I would have to say that the lines in Switzerland, Austria, and of course our own country, Norway, is the most scenic ones yeah. compared to the rest of Europe, which is basically flat. Garza, I think under the right circumstances, Amtrak could have been really great. But you look at the competition they have and how the railway or railroad in the United States is organized, it's um, yeah, it's just sad, really. Uh, you guys have such potential in your railway uh, or railroad, and not aiming to try to really make the best of it, it's kind of, yeah, I think that's sad. But that said, uh, seems like uh, seems like California is really pushing the limit. Uh, so they are doing some new high speed lines. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Midham, it's because I like cows. And I think cows are awesome. And that the Hindus, they actually worship cows. So yeah, uh, that was basically the reason. John Skinner, the temp outside on this trip was approximately 10, between 10 and 15 degrees. Nightflower, yes, uh, we are still socially distancing, uh, but uh, for uh, commuter, tra commuter trains or trips that are shorter than one hour, they can now do a full train, uh, but on the regional trains or trips that takes more than an hour, we are still just allowed to sell 50 to 70 percent of the capacity. My K, uh, yep, uh, it's not only that people really love their cars over there, uh, but it's basically because the whole society over there is built around the car. Uh, if you don't own a car, uh, you're kind of left out and that is kind of scary well bradford yeah that is correct and the private freight companies in the u.s built uh, their own network and kind of sliding or winding away from the federal uh, regulations they just extended their track as uh, sidings uh, there are just like huge sidings that goes everywhere with no tra no train protection or anything so yeah i think it's really weird that that is actually allowed
BK24, yeah, of course humidity in the form of water on the track will definitely do something with the friction between wheel and track. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Archmage. John Skinner, uh, they don't have mile markers in the tunnel specific for the tunnel's length, but we do have mile markers uh, for every kilometer or 500 meter as well, uh, out from Oslo and out from Trondheim. So um, Oslo is uh, zero point and then you just start counting one kilometer two kilometers etc out from there and the mile markers you can see them quite absolutely everywhere so hold on I will point one out for you uh, they are like square signals with a number on it So we are passing a mile marker right now. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Lloyd. Welcome, John Skinner. Stephanie S, uh, define high speed bullet train. Uh, do you mean like the Shinkansen in uh, Japan or? Stuart Moore, uh, you guys are lucky if he actually can pull that off. Midham, I have already done a 360 video on the Flum, uh, Flum line and you can find it if you just look at the 360 playlist. Uh, but that said, it will never be a camera mounted on the roof and the reason for that is the power line.
Thank you so much for the soup chat, John Skinner. Random person in a crowd. Uh, this is not live live. Uh, this is a recorded video uh, which was done like I think it was two weeks ago and just doing basically a Q&A. And reason for not streaming live from a train uh, is kind of um, because it would not look good if we had a trespasser strike broadcasted live onto YouTube and yeah that would not be good at all Shark girl this is a night sky thank you Nikia John Skinner, uh, we started out of Oslo at 10, no, 11.28 p.m. Uh, so coming into this station right now, I think I actually put the passing time. So you'll see, see the station. Thank you for watching, random person. Yeah, uh, passing through the station was 13 minutes past midnight. David, David, that might happen. Me? Yeah, you will definitely see the owl and moose in this video because it is the same video. Stephanie S. Yeah, uh, I will do that as soon as it is recorded. Jay Johnson, uh, this train is almost 300 meters long and... Um, Filming out the back of the train, uh, that would mean that I would have to leave the camera there in a public space, and no, so that will not happen. Thank you for becoming a member, Ben Shay. Yeah, do you really think so? Is my English that good? John Chang, and what kind of videos would I would you think I would produce then, or uh, what kind of videos would you like me to produce? 
Thank you, Raven. Okay, Johnson, then it would become really shaky. David, David, uh, when you drive the sleeper, uh, you have kind of a more laxed, um, you have more slack in the schedule, and there's a really good reason for that, and that is people are supposed to be able to sleep. Uh, we could just, we could have gunned out and, like, pushed it, like, the express and stuff like that. Uh, but there's no point in arriving in Bergen at like 4 a.m. in the morning. So the reason for this is that people will be able to get to their room or cabin on, on the train and sleep all the way from Oslo and then wake up in Bergen. So that is the thought and that's why the night train takes a lot longer than the morning express and afternoon express. Steve Cliff, uh, do you mean the doors like uh, on each side? Uh, those doors are basically into uh, the technical stuff. So, um, and there you have access to fuses and to different systems. Chang Chang, like announcements. Marian, um, I will never be able to show you how I actually operate the train. And that is just regulations. You're welcome, Stephanie. There are some horn sounds on this trip, uh, but if you see the horn signal and if you see a rectangular signal below it, which is half and half with black and yellow, uh, which is split diagonally, and that means that that is a day signal and means that you're supposed to sound a horn between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, which also means that you're not supposed to or you don't need to sound a horn between 10 and 6 at night. David, David? Uh, no, uh, we do not monitor uh, the switches from our cab. Uh, the switches are predetermined for the path of the train 
and that is programmed into a system which is monitored by the traffic controller. So if the predefined path is not, not optimal for, let's say, if some other train is delayed and they have to move the meeting point, then they can change the train path uh, to accommodate that situation. So these path, paths are predetermined. Uh, Naomi, this station is pronounced Rua. Nightflower? Uh, no, I haven't ridden so much train in other countries. Uh, I did some, yeah, basically metro in New York and I have done uh, the metro or um, the S train in Denmark and I've done some intercity in Germany and some intercity and local service in France and that's basically it. Thank you so much for the soup chat, White Tiger. Mr. UK Sergeant, you can actually tell them or ask if they can wake you up and then the conductor will add you to the list and when they reach and when you are getting close to your destination, they will actually come and wake you up. Rodrigo, uh, yes, uh, schedule is kind of different from week to week, but in general we are supposed to work 150 hours uh, in four weeks or 225 hours in six weeks. So on average that means that our days would be 37 and a half hour, or I mean each week. Um, but some days, like this trip, is like 20 and a half hour or something. And a whole shift. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's kind of hard. So all in all, some weeks we do like 60, 70 uh, to 70 hours and other weeks we do like three hours uh, because everything is of course compensated with I'm off Shark girl, uh, which derailment are you referring to? John Skinner, uh, we work crazy hours, so this the reason that you haven't seen any night trips earlier uh, previously is just because that camera technology hasn't been there uh, to catch it. Um, the GoPro is a really good camera, but the sensor is just too small to give you a really good light image. But with this camera, which is brand new, thanks to you guys, I am able to catch the Norwegian Midsummer Night. I will be able to catch starry skies during the winter. So yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to see how much more that I'm able to do with this camera compared to the GoPro. Um, but of course, getting more out of the image like this means that it takes up heaps more storage. So the insane thing is that this one trip here, uh, when it's done rendering, uh, it takes it's on the limit of what YouTube is able to handle. So the file is 128 gigabyte. 
and that's the video I uploaded but the raw files that comes off the camera uh, that was four terabytes so I've been editing four terabytes of video and then rendering it and then of course compressing it and sending it to YouTube for your amusement Stuart, I would really love to try that. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Revan. David Cutley, uh, yes, uh, driving uh, loco and cars are is very different from driving uh, EMU. Um, so the Class seventy five is it's a brilliant machine. Every every carriage is like really tightly connected, and it functions like one carriage. It's just like one unit. Uh, but when you drive a locomotive like this with trailing carriages, you really have to think that, yep, you are pulling the first carriage and the momentum of the first carriage will start to pull the next one and then the next one and next one and so forth until you have uh, all the mass in the whole train starting to move. Uh, so the initial torque is never maximum power. Of course, uh, because you just have traction on four wheels and they are in front of the train. So that that is things you kind of think about and you really sit there and feeling response from the locomotive uh, through your seat. You can see it on the meters and uh, you use all your senses when you drive uh, units like this. And I just love it. Driving locomotives like this, it's it's awesome. It's a different way of thinking, a different way of driving, and you really, really aim for that excellence in comfort for the passengers and the conductors who are walking up and down the aisle. Thank you for liking it, John Skinner. Ron Costa, yes, there is a lot more sightings of animals now uh, in this time of day as in this video. Uh, the best time for like deer and moose uh, is early, really early in the morning, just before sunrise. That's the best time for that. Uh, but on this trip, I saw several owls and foxes and of course they're was this moose that just carelessly just strutted across the track. It was um, it was awesome. Tony M, uh, to save uh, the raw files directly off the camera, I record everything directly to Samsung's T5 SSDs. Um, so I have two, now four, uh, two terabyte drives. So in total, eight terabytes, um, which gives me a lot more leeway. And after a trip, I just transfer that over to the laptop. And when I get back home, I start to edit the videos. And <laughs> this is kind of funny, but 
the drives on my editing computer are like one terabyte uh, SSDs and <laughs> so I basically edit straight off uh, T5s. John Skinner, uh, what company did you work for? Midham, uh, what if trains became driverless in the near future? Uh, I can tell you this, uh, trains here in Norway are not going to become driverless in the near future. Even though we get 5G and everything, uh, it's basically not going to happen. And the reason for that is pretty simple. One, uh, we don't have a homogenic network. Um, we have a heterogenic network, which means we have a lot of types of rolling stock. We have a lot of different companies running trains on these tracks. Um, and that means that these companies, are they willing to equip uh, their uh, rolling stock with the technology needed to have driverless trains? And then you have the infrastructure which we are running on and the topography and the mountains and the hazards we encounter there. Um, I don't think you would let an um, automatic unit like that are just basically reading off uh, reading off instruments and a Doppler radar and some sensors outside not being able to see two, three or four kilometers ahead on the track. I don't think you would... Nah. Um, the Norwegian network is definitely not ready for, uh, for automatic trains, but who knows? Um, we've seen politicians do crazy stunts before. It would happen. Uh, and if it happened, then I guess I'll do something else. Fly 24, um, considering the brake distance on a train, uh, it would be totally futile to try to stop. Um, actually, the, the best thing to do is if you're under a speed limit, increase your speed so you actually are running on the speed limit. Hey there, Alan. John Chang? Um, no, uh, it's more kind of if I see Anna crossing the track, it's like, ah, look, moose. Uh, and, and then it followed up with, well, please, come on, come on, get off, get off, get off. And then you have the relief. It's like, yeah, you made it. And yeah, that's about it. Right, Sigmund? Uh, no, uh, the successor of the flirt is not called KISS, but KISS is a train based on the flirt, uh, which is basically the double-decker edition of the flirt. So they called it KISS, and uh, they are going to run it in the States, in California, which is really cool. And they are running the case in a lot of different countries around Europe. And I know that 
they are looking into the case here in Norway to start running double deckers on the intercity uh, outside of Oslo uh, on the commute on the commuter trains. Uh, but that is just kind of a pre-project uh, evaluation thing to see what kind of upgrades they need to do on tunnels and bridge height and everything to be able to run double deckers here in Norway as well. Rikoi? Uh, yes, we eat while driving. And Montgomery, um, I think they do have some really long distance train that are totally autonomous in, uh, in Australia. And it is this, I think it is a coal company that is running uh, those trains uh, but they all kind of autonomous networks are closed networks so they do not run with different companies and uh, different types of train they are basically just one type of train running on one type of network which is uh, separated from the rest Yeah, so are some of the metros in uh, in Denmark as well, in Copenhagen. UK Sergeant, I totally agree. I totally agree. Like, yes, um, a moose is almost heavy as a car, uh, but it weighs like one tenth or one hundredth of a train. And the speed is not that slow. We Right now, it is uh, it is slow. It's 65 kilometers per hour. But at the point where I saw the moose, it was 70 kilometers per hour. So kind of slow there too. But imagine this seeing a moose crossing the track right in front of you while you are traveling at 130 kilometers per hour and you have a train which has a braking distance of between 600 and 800 meters yeah i'm really sorry but the moose is going to lose John Skinner, uh, they will just, if one train is really delayed, uh, they will try to move the meeting of that train to a different station. And you, and the rule is basically you are not supposed to delay a train that is running on schedule. So that means that the delayed train will end up becoming delayed. Andre, uh, we have 200 kilometers per hour lines here in Norway, but on this line I'm running now, this was the first original uh, path that uh, went for the Bergen line. So no, this line here is usually used by freight trains. So that's why we're going so slow, uh, because this line is really old. Uh, so this line has speeds between 60, uh, 65 to 80 and 90 kilometers per hour. Red flower? Yes. Uh, the reason that I um, just go to all is that because that's where we do have a crew change because we are not allowed to drive all the way from Oslo to Bergen and yeah, because that is like a seven to eight hour trip with this train.
Well, I will basically continue what I am doing. Improving and improving and improving. John, um, my experience is that if you sound the horn, uh, the moose will stop dead in the track. It will just stop and look at you because where does that sound come from? Uh, not the highly, most highly intelligent animal. Uh, so yeah, it's either they will like run off the track or s and someone just stop on the track if they hear the horn. So I come to the conclusion that I just don't sound the horn and just hope that they will just trot along and eventually get off the track. Stuart, yeah, uh, those uh, flirts, they are everywhere. Warm waffle, uh, is that a cabin that is just below uh, below the new construction, or is it an actual home? Because I really, really feel so bad for those people who it's basically going to be living under a bridge. So it was actually a home. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I hope they got a really good price for it because that place is so beautiful. And if anyone lo wonder what the warm waffle looks like, he is here. John Skinner, yeah, uh, I actually lived close to the tracks as well for like 10 years and after a while you just don't hear the trains anymore, they just, yeah, it's just part of normalcy. But when they don't come and when they are not on time, you definitely wake up.
David, um, did you mean one of the videos from the live stream when we came into Hønefoss and I had to back up? Or uh, do you know which video you're referring to? Idham? No, we did not. Uh, we went straight for Catenary. But uh, the subway in Oslo, the metro, they use a uh, third rail.
Thank you, thank you so much for the soup chat, big gal. We are now from the station called Hörnefuss. Now we're just venturing out on the original Bergen line again. So now it's like normal service. And uh, yeah, uh, it's full speed ahead to all. Norby? Um, no, I don't. Uh, the lights at those stations are really, really yellow. Midham, yes. Uh, you're, you're referring to a sun kink, and that happens if we have prolonged uh, days or like a prolonged time with high temperatures, then uh, the trackbed can become unstable and we will get something that is called a sun kink. And um, that can be quite, quite harsh and possibly lead to a de uh, derailment. Uh, it's not long ago we had a derailment uh, because of a sun kink and that was a freight train that went off the rails. Um, the, the tracks are inspected quite often and when we have temperatures and wet, really good weather over a long time, they do send out a bulletin that we have to be more keen uh, and observant than usual. Uh, so yeah, um, some kinks always happen on the weakest point of the track and that is in front of switch points and curves. Uh, Mr. Cool, are you meaning if the train breaks down on the track? David? Yeah, they are magnetic. Uh, it's metal.
And I want to give a shout out for, to Sakura for the super chat. And I'm really, really, really sorry I missed it. Um, yeah, it's... I'm really sorry. Nightflower, that is quite insane when you can hear the track moving. That is um, that is so cool. Mr. Cool, uh, our work days can range from usually they are between like seven hours to and all the way to 16 hours. And under some circumstances, they can be longer than that. Uh, but there are rules for that as well. Nightflower, that is correct. Uh, triangles that are pointing up means increased line speed and signs po or triangles pointing down is a warning of reduced speed. See you later, Stephanie. Mustafa, I'm doing good. How are you? David? No, fire away. Hey there, Arena. Victoria, uh, the next station uh, that we're going to be stopping at is, uh, is Nesbyen, because we're passing Flo. Uh, but the technical station or meeting point we are getting close to now is Vem. And here I will be s diverted into track number two. And then a freight train will be coming in the opposite direction. Nidhan, uh, you have to make sure that you come to work um, loosened and not tired. Uh, so I usually sleep for five, six hours uh, prior to a night shift uh, so yeah and then you don't get tired and during the summer when sky is so lit and light as it is now uh, it's much more easy and of course there are podcasts and I listen to a lot of podcasts on trips like this Uh, Mr. Cool, uh, I'm actually working this weekend, so I got off work this morning uh, after a long night shift. Just the same shift as you are watching right now. And then I'm going on a night shift again tomorrow. So, yeah, uh, it's my working weekend.
<laughs> Sean Chang, yeah. <laughs> I can say that I drink a lot of coffee. Hey there, East and West London Rail Productions. Thank you so, so much for the soup chat, Troy boy. George, uh, you will see this route in the opposite direction. Uh, I have several videos on that and I have also recorded it on the way to Oslo on like earlier the same day. And those videos will be available in the near future. Mr. Cool, ice on the track doesn't really affect uh, the friction that much uh, because the pressure between the wheel and rail will um, increase pressure between wheel and rail will transform the ice to uh, water and then push that to the side. So it's not that different from driving on a wet track. The inner rail? Um, do you mean on the switches or like places like bridges? Nightflower, you pronounce Veme. Uh, this station is pronounced Veme. Rikoi, I also listen to music while driving, yes. Victoria, uh, I have to record each video uh, and that is for safety reasons uh, because it wouldn't look good if I uh, had a passer strike being streamed live to YouTube. That is something YouTube would never accept. UK sergeant because I'm weird would be that So, so much for the soup chat, Phil Minecraft. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Nightflower. And you are so welcome. Mr. Cool, the end with numbers. Um, you mean the white uh, white plate on the signal? Uh, that is basically the ad identification plate or identification sign for that signal.
Mr. UK Sergeant, I jump out of fully functional planes. Wouldn't you say that I'm kind of crazy? Kevin, uh, I have been tri driving trains for, for a decade, actually. Naomi, you want Yoda back? I think Yoda is out shopping. Rinza, uh, we see wildlife every now and then. Um, usually between, like, in the early morning. Um, so yeah, it basically depends on what kind of day, uh, time of day you're at work. Uh, but I kind of see wildlife all the time. And the weird thing here is that in like the United States, you kind of have a lot more wildlife. Uh, whilst here in Norway, um, kind of keeps more away from like any human activity. So yeah. Um, we usually see them early in the morning. It's you, okay, Sergeant. I can promise you that I'm not gonna go AWOL or overboard. Minecraft, uh, could you please elaborate? Uh, I usually, I usually try to post videos like each week, uh, but with, with videos like these, uh, which requires a lot of space and a lot of time and a lot of time to render, not to mention that, uh, and with everything else going on, uh, haven't been able to like post new videos like each week so during the summer so I try to at least do every second weekend um, during the summer our work schedule is a lot more aggressive as well since we are running a lot higher production due to tourists um, <laughs> that was kind of set aside this year now like early in the summer due to uh, the given situation in the world with uh, the virus uh, but now the Norwegians have their 
vacation and everyone is vacating here in their own country. So we are now running full trains. We are running full trains in Flom and we have increased the production again. So uh, basically almost at work all the time. Oh, yeah, uh, it's crazy. Is there cool? Uh, no, I have never been a conductor. I went straight for driving. Here at Sokna, we are again uh, diverted into track number two. Um, because we have to wait for a freight train in the opposite direction. Boy, boy, um, if you hold on, uh, I'm gonna give you the right number. Boy, right now the number is 1336 times. When a man, uh, this is most definitely the effect of uh, of the camera used and the lights on this engine was is better than on some other engines uh, but thanks to the camera uh, it catches it beautifully it's uh, yeah uh, this camera is just awesome Mr. Cool, uh, this train has a maximum speed of 150 kilometers per hour with this current consist. Uh, but the top speed or highest speed limit on the Bergen line, which is on the mountain pass and in the tunnels outside of Oslo, it's 160 kilometers per hour, so around 100 miles per hour. Naomi Garza, this was at 1.26 a.m. Unlock? Yeah, my next jump will be elite. John? Yep, this is another meet. Welcome, Armin Nelson. Charco, I would love to come to Austin and jump. Mr. Cool, uh, what are you are you thinking about? What type of train this is, or what kind of locomotive is it, it is, or just basically what kind of train in general?
Jay Johnson, yes, most freight trains run at night uh, because that's when there's the least uh, passenger trains, which means more capacity for freight trains. Tramper cab, uh, the one we just, uh, the local uh, that just passed us uh, is the legendary EL14, uh, which is a six axle engine and brilliantly built. Uh, it was built here in Norway and yeah, um, it's a really good engine and it's still running even though it's now a really, really old locomotive. Um, there's not many left either. But they still run. Nightflower? Yes, that is exactly what I mean. So technical stations are stations where there are no platforms or the platforms and passenger exchange has been decommissioned and the station is basically just used to have a place on the line where two trains can meet. Gallop Trains 22, uh, they are uh, investigating the chance of having a high speed line between the larger cities in Norway, but that is, I don't think that's gonna happen in my lifetime, uh, or yours for that matter. Hey there, Jess Singo from Florida. How are you guys holding up all over there? George? Uh, yes, I have seen a lot of meteors while driving planes. Uh, but during the summer and right now, it's a bit too light. Uh, but in the end of August, sky is then turning more and more dark again and it's basically turning more and more dark right now since we passed midsummer uh, so when the stars are visible again again then we can start to see the meteor showers again too Rinsa, uh more people are taking the train now because they are on vacation here in Norway so the only difference right now uh, V is running higher production during the summer on the Bergen line due to tourists uh, and since all the foreign tourists did not come to Norway this year uh, for obvious reasons uh, the Norwegians are using the trains instead so we are almost fully booked but still you're just allowed to sell 50 percent of the train and in some cases 70 percent due to social distancing so it's nothing near uh, capacity uh, that we could have done and we're still running kind of limited service compared to uh, compared to normal service during the summer Stuart, uh, could you elaborate on the single line token system?
Okay, Stuart, uh, so you're talking about like a token that you physically pick up and that gives you the right to uh, drive to the next station and then you just give the token to um, the traffic controller there. Uh, is that the kind of system you're referring to? If so, uh, we don't use them here in Norway, but I know that the tram system in Oslo, they do have a token system when they do do single track because of maintenance work and stuff like that. Then they do have a token system. Uh, but for the railway, no, uh, we don't use a token system here. Mr. Cool, I have been driving trains for over 10 years. Hello? Yeah, I know. It's a great locomotive. Chang, thank you. Uh, but I am actually not a native English speaker. That is awesome, Grinza. We will welcome you. With Howell, uh, the training uh, to become a train driver is one year at the Rail Academy, and then you have to do it's three to six months of training in the company that hires you. Uh, so it depends on what kind of rolling stock and how many types of rolling stock and how many lines they are actually covering. Uh, so. Uh, you have to, yeah, so everything from one year and three months up to one and a half year, or you are out there driving. Off. David, uh, look for diamond shaped signals. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, yes, uh, this is 
kind of a part two or uh, a second part of my shift and so I had like eight and a half hours at the hotel where I could sleep and go out and get some food and stuff like that and so driving from Oslo to all is the second half of that shift so and we're required to at shifts like long shifts like this we're required to have some time off so we can have a rest before going back we will welcome you mr cole Cider, uh, the lights you see in the tunnels are not for illumination for the pure awesomeness of it, uh, but they're there for emergencies. So if we would break down on the line and we would have to evacuate, uh, those lights are those rail lights are there to basically lit up where you are supposed to walk. Tulsa, um, a bad day at work, um, breaking down on the line, a bad day at work, um, bad day at work, uh, I don't think anything I've encountered until the point I was taken by an avalanche really can be considered as a bad day at work because they're digging out the train with a shovel that was a really bad day at work but yeah <laughs> That flower? Uh, no, it's not a lot of space between the walls and the train but it's enough space to be able to walk uh, this station is called Trolldalen, and if we do a direct translation of Trolldalen, it means Trolls Valley. When luck, yeah, that that avalanche was a really bad day out work. Tramper Kev? Yes, I did driving the day before. Uh, this, as I said, uh, this uh, shift I'm showing right now, or this half of it, is uh, just part two. Uh, so I got up, started at work at 8.55 or 8.52, exact. And then traveled as a passenger on the Morning Express from Voss to Ol. Then I took over the train there and drove it to Oslo, had eight and a half hour of rest. And then going with the sleeper back to Ol and traveling as a passenger from Ol to and back to Voss.
David, David, uh, these tunnels on this line is actually dug with uh, I have uh, the first machine drill tunnel uh, on this line was uh, Gravhalsen, Gråskallen Gravhalsen, Gravhalsen tunnel from that goes from uh, Myrdal and down to Uppsete. Uh, they did that tunnel partially with machines, but they had to quit due to hitting harder rock type and then had to go back to hand drilling and yeah, the normal way of digging tunnels back in the days uh, so yeah these tunnels are dug with hands and tools of course Jesse Scott, yes, we do use uh, dedicated simulators uh, the academy uh, and that is just like for the airline companies, we train at extreme situations. Sean Chang, yes, we have a pedal that we need to hold down and every 50 second we have to lift our foot and press down again to show that we're still awake and lucid. Ariel, uh, I was at Akebrygge like yesterday. Uh, but usually not much down there when I'm in Oslo. CJ, uh, going through tunnels increases the pressure and the drag behind the train, so you push the air in front of you and you kind of generate a vacuum, uh, like a vacuum, behind the train pulling air into the tunnel, uh, and that is basically drag. Uh, so yes, uh, going into a tunnel will slow the train down, uh, so you have to increase power to keep the momentum um, yeah If you, th if you feel that the Finza tunnel is getting shorter and shorter, uh, I can give you a small list. You can half the playback speed and it lasts twice as long. David, David, the furthest, uh, furthest north I've been in Norway is Tromsø.
Ariel, uh, during the summer, there, <laughs> the sun is up all night. And during the winter, it gets really dark up there. And the day is, like, really short. Uh, but it's not, like, pitch black all night or, or all day and night. Um, but the sun kind of creeps slightly. You can see, you can actually see light, but you don't see the sun. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. With Howell, uh, the voltage we are running on ranges between 15 and 17 kilovolts, uh, depending on what kind of line you are on. Uh, but here on this line, uh, the voltage is usually solid on 16 kilovolts. Miguel, uh, yes, uh, I am actually considering doing another bike ride, uh, but um, <laughs> I am going to need time to do it. And right now, uh, skydiving and work kind of takes up absolutely everything. John Chang? Uh, no, I'm not on that station. That station is just a technical station. Uh, the platform is sealed off and there are no passengers. No, we don't do any passenger exchange on that station anymore. Oh my Garza, I think we just passed the Circle K. Caleb, yeah, I know. Uh, it's pretty awesome that the hot scene from Emperor Strikes Back was actually done at Finsa. Marian Bedro, no, I have not tried an electric bike yet. Mr. UK Sergeant, uh, yes, I have been at the fortress and their World War Museum, uh, and everyone in Norway uh, that has grown up around Oslo or in Oslo has actually been to that museum, so it's very interesting. Um, a lot of history there, uh, a lot of history. Ariel, I think they're all awesome.
David? Um, it's uh, the terrain is like yeah, it is in most of the coastal cities here. Uh, you have a flat part and the island, of course, uh, um, and then you have the mountainous backdrop. So yeah, it's uh, it's a rugged, uh, rugged terrain. Rob Jackson, no, that is actually not diplomatic. Um, if if it was someone I didn't like, uh, they wouldn't be in, be doing what they are doing. Hey there, Sakura. Sakura, uh, I'm really, really sorry I missed your super chat earlier. Um, the only excuse I have was that in the beginning things were kind of going crazy with the, with the notification system and I'm truly sorry about that, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Rob Jackson. Alan Smith, uh, no, the catenary towers you see there on the outside of the curves are there to hold the catenary up. Uh, and they are put on the outside because of physics. Thank you, Mr. Cool. Adventures uh, on the regional train like this one you have right here, uh, you would have to buy several tickets if you want to get on and off. And the reason for that is the seat reservation. So if you want to, for example, go from Oslo to Nesbyen, then you buy a ticket for Oslo to Nesbyen, and then you get off there and you have a new ticket for Nesbyen and to your next destination. 
and all of this can be done through a travel agency uh, or you can buy a separate ticket for each leg yourself uh, through the website of the train company. Tramper Kev, uh, no, it's not intended to run at line speed. Uh, the average speed for this train is slightly lower than for the express. And the reason for that is that it will be totally useless for the train to arrive in Bergen at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so they give us a lot more slack so we can drive more comfortable so people can sleep and we will arrive in Brigin at 6.30. Nightflower, the traffic controller just contact us when needed. So if there is some changes uh, of where you're gonna meet some trains or if something is delayed or something will delay my train, then they will contact us. But besides that, they we don't talk. Um, we can use the cab radio or the GSMR cab radio to send texts. So we have some predefined texts and codes we can send and then we get a code with a predefined text back. So yeah, uh, it's a good system. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Edward. You're welcome, Nightflower. Blanco, uh, the passenger numbers now are much lower than before and the reason for that is that we're just allowed to sell out on long trips like this we're just allowed to sell out a uh, 50% of the capacity uh, due to social distancing uh, but on trips that are less than an hour they can sell out the whole train so Typically local service, no problem, but on trips that are more than an hour, you are reduced to like 50 and 70% of the capacity, depending on what kind of train it is. Martin, yes, uh, we started with the sleeper service again, I think it was uh, 1st of July, uh, that was when we started running it. At first we were just running it on the weekends and then the passenger numbers started to go up and we extended that and started running full service just, I think it was a week afterwards. Jay Johnson, no. Uh, if you fill up all the seats in a train, then it will be marked as sold out. If there is capacity, they might put on another carriage, but carriages are limited. And the reason for that uh, is that the park or the pool of carriages is now split between three companies. And if a company has capacity that they don't use, we are not allowed to use their carriages because we are not um, uh, 
we are not the one maintaining their carriages. We are not the one having a contract on those carriages. And yeah, so uh, what can I say? The privatization and <laughs> splitting on the railway in Norway has been such a success when it comes to resource coverage and usage. It's like the most stupid thing ever. Ah. It makes me mad. Now the three companies does not share rolling stock. They have the same type of rolling stock, but they do not share rolling stock due to the contract they have with the rolling stock owner, which is called Norwegian Trains or Norske Tog. And it's just so stupid. You have one company that owns the rolling stock and you have three passenger services renting a pool of rolling stock from the rolling stock company. It's, yeah, uh, it's so freaking stupid. It's just so unimaginably stupid. See you later, Alana. Okay, Johnson. No, we does not own the cars. It was actually ripped out of the company when they split everything out. George, uh, the circular building you saw uh, is one of the few water towers that are still existing along this line. Uh, so back in the days when they were running steam here, uh, they would fill the steam engine with water at one of those places. Consider, uh, I'm not sure how long the contract will last, but I guess it will last for the whole tenor of and the franchise. Uh, so the bid was uh, for a company to run the line and services for uh, 10 years uh, with the option of added years after that. I think that will be like one and one and one year. Uh, and so I as the contract with the, uh, with the rolling stock pool is for the same time period. Um, but that said, uh, it's not illegal for a train company to go out and purchase their own rolling stock. But then again, what kind of company would go out and buy rolling stock if they're not guaranteed to have a continued franchise after 10 years. Who would go to that extent and go out and buy more rolling stock? It's just freakingly stupid. I sure wouldn't do that. So a safe thing would be renting the rolling stock, but I would for sure not own my own, own rolling stock and come to the point where, oh yeah, uh, no, we're not going to run this franchise anymore, so what are we going to do with the rolling stock? Ugh. It's, uh, I guess you just have to be a politician to just not be able to exist. Daily dose of Alexa, that is completely true. Most of the people here are people who wants to get to know each other through a really easy chat is really laid back. Welcome.
Thank you, Wallon veteran. Light flower, yes, that is so true. Uh, complete madness of it is uh, when you buy a ticket you buy a train ticket from a company called Entur and that gives you the right to ride from station A to B with the train company who is servicing the line who rents the rolling stock from another company or in this case Norske Tog uh, running uh, driving on the infrastructure run by Bana Nord in a schedule set by the department. It's like, hello? <laughs> it's uh, it's mind-blowingly stupid. And they say, yeah, but the, with this organization, uh, the companies will be focusing on what they're doing really good. So you have a train company, they are supposed to just to drive trains and they're going to do that really well. Uh, but yeah, what if something happens? What you ha what if you have that some if something happens that will cover all companies who will be responsible? Like, yeah, they don't know. So that is one of the big issues right now. Who will take care of what when things doesn't work? And it's um, I think we're going to have the same debate here in Norway as they have been having in Great Britain for the past 30 years. And that is when are we going to re renationalize the rail service? And so, yeah, I guess that discussion will probably start already within six years. Yeah, Mr. UK Sergeant, I'm gonna go FUSA on this. FUSA. Caleb, yes, some American locomotives have toilets and some Norwegian locomotives also have toilets. Guess what? Those locomotives are actually American. Hey there, Naomi. Welcome back. And for those wondering, we just passed through the station called Bergeheim. Barry Edmund, I don't think I would do very well as a politician. Um, I think that would have to do something with my compassion and passion for the subjects I am interested in. And politicians, they 
have to compromise on so many things and when you have so many people trying to compromise on so many various things you are going to end up with a pa a bag full of shit and yeah it's um it's uh it's not easy for them either but things like this privatization the rail that is purely and really simple but they did this out of pure ideology and putting all um, experience from other countries who has done the same aside because they think it's going to work here even though it hasn't worked anywhere else in the world why but Yes, they're just, you know, they really believe in it and they try to reap the benefits from it right now. Uh, everything they say is, yeah, look at the railroads running really well uh, after we privatized it. And it's like, uh, guys, you haven't reaped anything from it. Uh, they just took over. And uh, so, yeah, uh, but they say they saved us a lot of money. Which is not true uh, it basically costs the same but they put the expense from the government and onto the users so are your ticket prices basically but that's less service very ticket price it's uh it's, that's the recipe for success That's true, Caleb. Ariel T. Uh, Gurner can get his cow after his name if he becomes a member of the channel membership. So it's totally up to him. Thank you, David. Mike R, uh, I haven't been driving trains for a decade, so it's, yeah, it's beginning to become a very long time. Hey there, Patricia. Welcome back. Consider, yep, that is basically it. Jay Johnson, yes, we do still have senior discounts. Uh, some companies don't have it. I'm not sure which one of them. I'm not going to mention any one of them, uh, but I know that there's a company that don't have senior discount anymore. Uh, but we still do. Thank you so much for the Super Chat Servant of Milan. Kurt Warner, uh, this was recorded on the sleeper that had its departure from Oslo at 11.20. 8 uh, p.m. and we are now getting close to Nesbyen and see we'll find out when I was there hold on
So at the moment when I'm passing through this curve right here, the time was 2.23 a.m. Hey there, Mr. Cole. Nightflower, uh, there's a code between all drivers and that they say or they wave. So during nighttime, we just turn on the light in the cab and turn it off again. And we just wave. And during daytime, we wave. So uh, it's an acknowledgement to all other drivers out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the soup chat, Simon. Uh, unmasking. Uh, that might happen. Uh, would be when... And if uh, the channel surpasses 100,000 subscribers. Uh, but I do have a small thing uh, in the plan and planning for something. Yeah, we'll see. Hey there, Th Thomas. Nice to meet you too. Steve Blanco, yes indeed it is. The new camera is brilliant on capturing and being able to present how it really looks like when we're out there during nighttime. Um, Mosider, no, uh, actually not. Uh, I would love to do the Trans-Siberian Railway and I would love to do the Orient Express as well, uh, but we'll see what happens in the future when there is, when I have more time on my Mr. Cool, which one of the beep sounds? Double beeps or uh, single beeps or... Jörn Thomas? Uh, we sometime have to travel as a passenger to Bergen, uh, but very seldom we do that to Oslo from where I'm based. Uh, but we do travel as passenger from Voss to example, for example, Ål, uh, where we will do a cover for the drivers that are at Ål if they are vacation and stuff like that, like now. So right now, the people that usually cover these trains, uh, trains uh, are on vacation, and then we step in to cover that, and vice versa when they come and cover our part.
Mr. Cool, the double beep sound is when I double tap the pedal, the Sifa pedal. Then the train starts to count out the total length of the train, which I have uh, pre-programmed into the computer system. So we use that when we in situations where we don't see the end of our train. And especially when you are coming through a curve where you have increased line speed when you get out on the stretch. So coming out of the curve and you see the signal for increased line speed, uh, then I double tap uh, the pedal as I pass that signal. And then it will start to count. And when the whole train has run out its length, it will give me a double beep, which is an indication that the whole train has, has, has the increased line speed, uh, line speed signal. And then I can increase the speed. I also use the double tap if I don't see the end of the, my train and I am going to stop on a platform that doesn't have any markers for uh, where trains with a given length are supposed to stop. Uh, so I do double tap when I hit, kind of hit the platform edge and then it will start counting and give me a double beep when the whole train is within the platform. I actually wish they had the same system on the flirt when we are running two uh, train sets connected together. It would make things a bit more easy, but they don't have that on the train. So in circumstances like that, I just count catenary poles uh, since it's about 60 meters between catenary poles and you can just count down and yeah, now I've passed uh, X amount of meters, now I can increase speed. Uh, Ariel, uh, I like both times of year. I actually like all four seasons. Um, it's uh, Summer gives a different vibe compared to winter, but they are equally beautiful. Doug Harvey, um, I have to go to the bathroom, I have to go to the bathroom, and that's how it is. Uh, but usually you just make sure that you can keep it in until you reach your destination. Um, but uh, it was once I had to go to the bathroom and it delayed the train with about seven minutes or something, so yeah. Uh, we try to avoid things like that uh, <laughs> and it was marked out in the schedule as well. You could see the reason for delay. Driver had to go to the bathroom. See you later, Nightflower. Jens Stahlström, uh, I would really like to give you those numbers, but in the current climate, uh, that has suddenly ended up like a company secret. So, um, sorry, I'm not going to be able to elaborate on that.
consider. <laughs> no, they didn't. Uh, it's just in the internal systems where you can kind of follow your progress. So yeah, that was the only place it was uh, mentioned. Jay Johnson? Yeah, seven minutes. You have to get off the train, then you have to walk to the nearest bathroom, and you have to do what you need to do, and then you have to walk back. And if there are passengers using the bathroom, then you have to wait. Is there cool? Uh, it depends on the winter, on how much snow we get. Uh, this year we had a lot of snow in the mountains and the snow is actually still there at some places. Uh, but in the lowlands we had a really wet winter with mostly rain and yeah, one week with snow and one week with rain and that was basically, basically, basically the winter. Uh, yeah, so it depends on what kind of weather coming that is coming in from the coast and how the winds up high and the air masses are moving. So some winters can be like really dry and cold and others can be very snowy and like just under sub-zero temperatures while those other winters can be like really wet and warm. No, Megarsa? Yeah, uh, it is getting brighter in this part in the video right now because the sun is actually on its way up again. Master, what defines uh, how long we are staying at the station is the schedule and it's basically what kind of train you're running and at what time of day and yeah and so forth. Uh, it's, uh, it's an agreement between those who make the schedule and the train company that have certain needs and stuff like that. Mr. Cool? Yeah, I really like my job. And I guess that is the reason why I'm doing this and have been doing so for over 10 years.
See you later, Jay Johnson. Hulkmaster 3, uh, I have done so on three different occasions, but the reflection in the windshield makes it almost impossible for the camera to capture, uh, capture who's in the train. Uh, but I have opened the door after I've stopped when we're going towards Bergen and waved to the camera. The station we are entering now is called and pronounced Gul. Is it cool? Yeah, I like cows. Ariel, yeah, I know that it opened in 1883 as a narrow gauge railroad and it was converted uh, when they connected it to the Bergen land in 1909. Like our, um, our shifts ranges from like four hours on short days to like 16 hours on really long days. Uh, this shift right here is particularly long, uh, but is still within the regulations. Uh, but uh, when it comes to how far we can get, it's, uh, it's basically the Bergen line. Uh, if you're based on a Bergen line, you drive the Bergen line. If you are working in another company that is covering another line, then that's all you do. And it's organized that way because they just split up everything into franchises and privatized everything here. Tramper Kev, it's pronounced Yailo. See you later, Folkmaster 3. Thank you, thank you so much for the soup chat, Jimmy.
Thank you, Day of the Rope. With our flag, uh, we just passed the uh, uh, ghoul, so we just left the station, so we're still in the ghoul area. Marco Antonio, uh, it was dedicated drivers who uh, who's been running trains between uh, Oslo and Göteborg in Sweden. Uh, so I never did that when I was based in Oslo uh, because you needed to have the Swedish, Swedish safety education as well. Um, so as I said, there was a group of dedicated drivers who did that and closest to the border we got uh, was Holden. Rikes? Uh, yes, uh, earlier in this video we saw a moose just crossing the track carelessly and there has been a couple of owls and so yeah, uh, during daytime there's uh, this time of year uh, the young eagles who were hatched during the spring they are now out and about and flying on their own so and claiming their territory so we see a lot of eagles these days and I find those birds just so magically majestic. the rope uh, if we see an animal on the track uh, we just do what we do we continue if I have a favorite station uh, but I would have to say if I had to choose it would definitely be Finsa. Hey there Doug Harvey. Uh, no, uh, I was not born in the US um, so that my language or English has been kind of what shall I say? Uh, formed by all the movies and TV series up through the years. Uh, so basically cable TV. And also probably because I've traveled the States a lot and that I have, that I'm a child of, was a child of the internet. Uh, so I embraced that technology. And so, yeah. Uh, most of the time I've been communicating in English with friends and everything and so I guess it just fell in there naturally. Day of the rope? That is correct, we don't slow down.
Yeah, of the rope. Um, I'm gonna elaborate a bit more on that. Um, the reason that we don't slow down is that there's a higher chance that you're gonna injure the animal instead of killing it if the speed is high enough. Uh, and injuring it and having to just lay it and lay around for hours before a hunter can come and do the job for us is not very humane. And it would not be you know, of the interest of the animal as well. So usually we do not reduce speed at all. And that is to make sure that we are able to, if we do hit the animal, that it won't survive. It's a horrible thing to do, uh, but it's something that you get accustomed to. And it's just part of the job. It's the part we don't speak much of. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, there are a lot of incidents out there. In in a couple of them myself, uh, where you see people straight into the eye and just can see it. They understand that their time is up. It's uh, it's a weird thing, um, and it's not very nice being the person that ends a life. It's uh, it's not cool. So the next station we're going to be passing through now is a technical station called Torpo and in track number two or one, actually it's track number one, you will see a train which is the sleeper that went started its trip from Bergen and it's on its way to Oslo. Thank you so much for the super chat Ian Walker. I'm really glad you liked that video because uh, I am going to do some more of those. Caleb, yep, that is right. Uh, we do have, uh, or Cargonet has, a train that is called the Arctic Rail Express that goes all the way from Oslo to Narvik through Sverige or Sweden. Sweet dreams, Wonder Man. Naomi Garza, yeah, that is really awesome. Um, I thought that the 360 would be a real good tool doing a bike video like that, and it seems like it was spot on. Full vacations, yeah, uh, you are told to speed up and because that increases the chance of the animal being tossed over the car instead of coming through your windshield.
Welcome, Arvark. Great segment. Uh, yes, that that would actually be a really good idea. Uh, it has been presented for the politicians on numerous occasions, but it seems like they don't want to be the one who starts it. It's uh, kind of weird. Thank you so much for the soup chat, Steva. segment uh yes uh they would really love it um just know that there is a government that really loves to reap off everything benefits from the previous government and yeah uh it's uh it's just stupid uh, that they claim be the one that actually started it when it was like no was the previous government who actually did that uh, so we'll see what kind of projects they started now that the next government will be able to reap good luck uh, what happens from here uh, when we reach all now uh, then my uh, day is basically over uh, so I will go back as a passenger to Voss. Steva? No, uh, it's a bit more noisy uh, in real life. Uh, I had to turn down the volume on the source to uh, level up the voice uh, because there was some mentioning earlier that the voice didn't wasn't able to penetrate the sound of the engine um, but there's uh, there's some noise in in the cab uh, that comes from uh, from the, the ventilation system. Switch in on dreams, George.
Teen screen? Yes, we can do this while listening to music. And now that we have arrived all, uh, that means that there's going to be a crew change and that will be the end of my trip. So thank you everyone for joining in today. It's been really awesome. Um, it's been a really long trip and I hope to see you here on the next installment when we do this the other way during daytime. So thank you everyone for joining in and see you later. Thank you. And thank you so much for the super chat, Shroy Boy. Thank you.